Uh, my name is Emily Anderson. I am the Assistant Adult Programming and Outreach Coordinator for the Dauphin County Library System. Um, and I am very happy to introduce Anne Bodling tonight uh, for uh, supporting your garden's pollinators. Um, I'm going to introduce Anne briefly and then I'm going to pass it on over to her. Having been a horticulture major in college and having spent more hours wandering the university's arboretum than sitting in class, it was inevitable that sooner or later, Anne would be begin collecting wild seed and growing and gardening with native plants in her own landscapes. She has continued on in various capacities ever since. In 2006, Anne became the Monada Conservancy Native Plant Facilitator, creating educational and instructional materials and presentations for those wishing to plant their properties with native plants. And in 2008, Anne became the Gardening for Nature Liaison, assisting property owners with planting design and encouragement in their efforts. During this time, she also worked at Doyle Farm Native Plant Nursery in Southern York County, as well as provided gardening services for a number of clients. Anne, Anne continued in her role with Gardening for Nature for a few years after moving to Southern, excuse me, <laughs> Anne continued in her role with Gardening for Nature for a few years before moving to Southern Maryland, where she began creating new gardens for herself in the children's garden at the environment Environmental Center where she worked. She also created a small nursery from which she sold native plants herself. Now, having moved back to South Central PA after being away for 10 years, Anne is once again planting new gardens and restoring habitat where she now lives outside of Dillsburg, PA, delighting in the birds and insects that are making themselves at home. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Anne. Um, without further ado, take it away. Okay. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for having me. And this is always a favorite topic, so I'm going to plunge right in. Um, the introduction said pretty much what needed to be said. I'll just highlight again that during those years in college, the, the West Virginia University Arboretum was a wonderland of ways to learn uh, both about plants, about birds, and that was the start uh, of the rest of my life, I guess you'd say. So I'm going to share my screen and then we'll just get started. So gardening for pollinators, and I know that there's a probably quite a difference in, in interest in levels of those that are already gardening, those that want to get started gardening for pollinators. Some of what I say you'll know, hopefully there'll be something um, of interest that you don't know yet. And so here are some of them to begin with. In this program, I'll present several topics. Who and what are pollinators? What makes an insect a pollinator? Uh, why do we want to support them? Who are they? How do you recognize them? And, and most importantly, what do they need to thrive in the gardens that we create for them? So who are they? We have bees. There's 4,000 or so species of bees in North America. There's wasps. And all of them, many of them are not aggressive, but wasps are also pollinators. There's flies that look an awful lot like bees, some that don't look anything like bees. There's moths. This is a clear wing moth, a hummingbird moth, we call it, that flies in the daytime. But most moths fly at night, so we don't see much of them. There's butterflies. And then there's beetles, which Beetles don't play a huge part, but nevertheless, they are also pollinators. So before going further and making sure I don't forget, this is a book that you might want to purchase. It's an excellent resource. Um, this woman has gone through various habitats that either are in the wild or that we can create depending on our conditions. She outlines what, what pollinators we're likely to see. She outlines which plants are are particularly effective, what their blooming times are, um, what they need, where you might find those insects and those plants in this country, there's maps. So if there was one book you were going to get, this would be the one I'd recommend. And there's a lot of books out there. Um, this one's just particularly good. There's also a, a, a website called Bug Guide, B-U-G, I think it's G-U-I-D-E uh, dot net. 
And it's a place to go to help with identification of the insects you see in your yard. And the nice thing about Bug Guide is usually, since there's these waves of insects through the season, what you're wondering about or what I'm wondering about, other people are wondering about. And so that's some of the questions that come up when you go to the, the guide. What are the prominent questions right now is probably the insects that you're looking at as well. Um, so that's that book. So moving on, what do, what do these pollinators need? And what can we provide for them and how? And a little while later, I'll talk about how the pollination takes place in these different species I've mentioned. But I like this picture of this spider web because I like to think of habitat as a habitat web and all the strands that go into making, creating a habitat is what makes it strong, what makes it function as a support system. And we can create those habitat strands, which is you know, what the program's really about tonight. Food is the first, uh, food, shelter, water, and places to raise young are the components of habitat. So food we'll come back to because that's the bulk of the program, why we're, we're gardening in the first place is to provide food for the most part. Um, so we'll come back to this one, but just to say at the beginning here now that there's a couple different ways to think about food for these insects. Caterpillars are the ones that actually consume the plant. Butterflies, bees, moths, beetles, some beetles do. Um, but caterpillars are primarily the eaters of the plant, the leaves and the flowers. And then bees and butterflies and moths in particular are after either the nectar or the nectar and the pollen. So this bee here, all this yellow that you see here is pollen. And that's primarily on a sunflower what the bees are after. So they take this pollen back to their, either their, if they're a honeybee back to their hives, if they're a, a bumblebee back to their ground nesting hive uh, nests, if they're solitary bees, which don't nest in groups, then it, they take it back to where they, their nest is. And that becomes food for the young. Uh, and we will talk more about sunflowers and bees as we go along as well. Water is um, a vital resource to any organism, as we already know, even for insects, even for insects that uh, take nectar from flowers. So if we provide water, we're offering that service. It doesn't have to be a pond this size by any means. This is where we live and we inherited this when we bought the house. And you'll see insects down here on the lily pad leaves. I'll see the wasps that particularly seem to like this rock and they'll crawl down to the very bottom, the water's edge, and that's where they'll drink or these rocks. So the, the important thing about water for pollinators is that it, they need a shallow place where they can hold on and dip their little mouths in to drink. The same with this bird bath. It's a gentle slope and they can crawl down. You could use a lid. You could use a plant saucer um, that you put underneath a plant pot. Can be shallow, can be a deeper container if you put rocks in there so that they can crawl down to the water's edge. Shelter, when we're talking about shelter for insects is really easy. When we're talking about shelter for birds, we're talking about trees and shrubs or for larger animals, we're talking about even more so, but for insects, we don't need much. So if you've planted any part of your yard already, no matter what it's planted with, you've already created shelter. You may have noticed, and if you haven't noticed, go out tomorrow morning and look if you have flowers in your yard. And many times you'll see bees sleeping upside down, sometimes holding on to plant stems in the midst of the flower heads like this. Butterflies will go under the leaves. Um, beetles will be under the leaves or in the flowers. Um, so shelter is a place where they can hide, where they can be uh, sheltered, like from the rain we just got. I know right now I have a lot of bees clinging under the joe pie, which is what this is. And then another plant I'll show you in a bit. 
Uh, but shelter is another important piece of habitat for them. Here again, this is a pretty dense planting. So the bees would be un could be under the leaves. They could be on the flowers themselves overnight. It's really um, cheery to go out in the morning when the dew is heavy on the, on the plants and look and see these little bees are just covered with dew. And they, they seem to wait until the sun comes out and dries them off. And then if you have shrubs or if you're planting shrubs, of course, that's more shelter yet. The places to raise young is, it's not complicated, but it's buried with these different insects. So this here is a, a gall. It's, this was a, gold, a goldenrod gall um, fly. So a tiny little fly lays an egg inside the stem of this goldenrod. And in response to that disturbance, the goldenrod starts creating cells of plant tissue, which becomes this gall. And as the egg hatches inside there, it's snug in there until it hatches. As a larvae, it stays in there, and then it emerges and goes and flies off to hunt, to look for nectar. So goldenrod in particular, since it's just now starting to come into bloom, if you have access to somewhere where you can go walk in it or next to it, you might look for these. Um, they're pretty common. So those are the flies and the flies tend to use stems for the most part. Butterflies and moths will tend to lay their eggs on the leaves of their host plants. So the host plants are the plants, um, as we'll get to in a minute, where the young, that's what they eat. It's all that they eat until they pupate and turn into adults. So the, the butterfly or the moth is laying their egg here on the upside down of the, the leaf of this host plant. And it will stay there until it hatches. And this is a monarch. So we're kind of familiar with monarchs and hear a lot about them. Once the egg hatches, they're teeny, just teeny tiny little creatures. And over the course of their caterpillar life, they, they grow, but they shed their skin. So they go through what's called instars or stages. And each one gets larger. They grow their new skin. They shed their skin like all insects because it confines them. And once they shed it, they can grow larger. So they go through this series of instars, eating all their way. So you see what's happening to these leaves. They're disappearing as the caterpillar gets bigger. And this, this happens until they're ready to pupate. And I don't have a picture of that. So what happens with these um, caterpillars typically don't spin their cocoons or their chrysalises on the same plant where they've been eating all this time. They usually crawl away. Sometimes you see them crawling, you'll see caterpillars crawling across the ground, wonder where they're going. They're looking for another plant oftentimes or the siding on your house or a deck railing, and then they'll, they'll hang their cocoons or their chrysalis from there. The reason the Zinnia picture is here is because it makes a really good stand of plants if there's if there's um, milkweed nearby and you have monarchs nearby, they seem to go to zinnias. They'll go to other plants as well, but um, zinnias makes a good place for them to go through the rest of their life cycle before they emerge as butterflies. And this slide is here because so many of the, um, for those, moths and, and uh, butterflies that create their chrysalises that hang on to plant stems. Some of them are only there for a couple weeks. Some of them are there for months and they overwinter. So if they've attached their chrysalis or cocoons to any of these dried plant stems and we leave them standing over the winter, then we've, we've ensured that they're going to be able to emerge in the spring. Not all uh, butterflies and moths do this, but quite a few do. Um, so it's a way of perpetuating the species. If you have an area where you can leave some, some sticks, stems standing, or if you get tired of seeing them, like I do too as well, you can gently remove them and stack them against a wall somewhere. Uh, what you don't want to do is put them through the shredder in the fall um, for obvious reasons, as you know that somebody's nesting in there. 
So those are the butterflies and moths. They go through that cycle of egg to uh, um, caterpillar to pupating to adult. And then they fly off and they have a couple weeks to find more host plants to lay their eggs before they die off and the new generation is born. Bees are a different story. So bees primarily nest, um, I think 90% of bees are, are solitary bees. They, they don't nest in groups, they nest one on one. They either dig tunnels in the ground. They also will use plant stems to lay their eggs. Uh, bumblebees like this one nest in the ground in communities. Because bumblebees nest in the ground, there's a whole host of bumblebee species. They're not aggressive. In fact, when I used to work at the children's garden, I would show kids how when bumblebees are busy on flowers like this, you can pet them in the back. You can, you can pet the backs of them if you're gentle and they don't care, they're so busy eating. You don't do that with wasps, of course, or with yellow jackets, but you can do it with bumblebees. They need open ground. They'll use rodent holes or snake holes. They'll use just plain loose friable soil. They'll dig their own holes if they can't find something else. So leaving a, a small patch of dirt of soil where nothing's growing, it doesn't even, it doesn't have to be large. That's another place that bumblebee communities particularly will lay their eggs. Bees of all kinds, not bumblebees, but other, other species will use plant stems They'll use stems that are left over from last year, particularly where the tops have broken off. And especially if the stem is hollow, they lay their egg in the stem and then they go get plant material and they bring it back and they stuff that down in. And then they lay another egg and they go get more plant material and they stuff that down in. And they're creating individual cells for each of their individual eggs. So the plant stems that, are, that we leave um, say this fall, winter comes, our yard's full of plant stems. Again, if we can leave them until spring when we see the new growth happening, that's great. If we can't stand it, then we can remove them again and set them against a wall somewhere where they're protected. Something I learned this last spring I was reading about was that if we, so those are the hollow stems. Some plants are hollow stems, some are not. Some are are full of plant material, pithy material. If we, if we cut those off, say a foot above the ground and we leave them and we just leave them there and this year's growth comes up through them, it's the following year they will have hollowed out on their own and then they become available for the bees as well. And they don't, they're not unsightly because all the new growth has covered them up. So there's a lot we can do in the way of nesting spaces uh, for bees that we may not have known about beforehand. Bees also will use leaf litter in our yards. They'll use grass clipping piles sometimes. Uh, moths and butterflies also will, um, once their caterpillar goes to pupate, some of them do that and they live over winter under the leaves for all winter long, protected. And then they emerge in the spring as butterfly or moth. So even if you don't want to leave your whole yard covered with leaves, which is understandable, if you have a place with a shrub or several shrubs that you can pile your leaves, you can take the leaves from your grass and put them there, that creates habitat, not only for the bees and the um, butterflies and moths, but for birds who come along and spend time scratching through that in the winter. It, it's just a great habitat source for all Turtles, toads, um, everybody seems to appreciate leaf litter, except for humans sometimes. This was my garden several years ago when I lived outside of Elizabethtown. And this was how I left it in the winter time for all these reasons. Seed heads for the birds, there were seeds under all the snow. Uh, bees and butterflies and moths had places to live. It was, work to cut some of that down in the spring without question. But the same thing could happen in a three by three foot garden or a five by five foot. Nobody has to have a garden this size. 
If you're compulsive like I am, you can put your whole yard and garden after your kids are grown, uh, but it doesn't have to be that way. But you can see from this slide that if you offer um, plant material over the winter, it's going to be a snug place for overwintering of any species. So this brings us back to food, back to the food component of habitat that we'll spend the rest of this time on. And when we think about food, as I said, um, host plants are plants that are particular to certain species of, of moths and butterflies. Some moths and butterflies will lay their eggs on any number of plants, and it doesn't matter, those insects, can, those, those moths and butterfly caterpillars can eat from many different plants. Some are specialists like monarchs, which we're so familiar with. There's three or four species of, of milkweed. This is called swamp milkweed. And it's a lovely plant. There'll be a couple slides further on. Uh, it stays where you put it. It gets quite bushy. It flowers for weeks. Um, it's a really a garden worthy milkweed for putting in your garden, as opposed to uh, where we saw those caterpillars eating on that earlier um, plant where most of the leaves were gone. That's a common milkweed like you see along the roads and the highways. That milkweed runs by rhizomes and runners underground and it will form large colonies, which is fine if that's what you want. If you don't want a large colony in your garden, then this swamp milkweed would be the one to think about planting. Or butterfly weed is a bright orange um, milkweed as well that also stays where you put it and the monarchs are quite happy with. If you've grown parsley or dill or fennel or rue, the herb rue, um, celery or cutting celery, you may have seen these little guys, these black swallowtail caterpillars. And right now every year, I'm remembering that I wanted to have more parsley plants than a few so that I could keep eating parsley because right now they're hosting all these little caterpillars. Um, which I prefer that the caterpillars get the parsley. So they're an unusual caterpillar in that they're very happy to eat many of the plants that are not native to this country, like the black swallowtail is native to this country. And most of the time, they'll, most of the time, most species of insects will feed on the plants that are native to the area where they're living, but not the black swallowtail. So dill, fennel, parsley. Uh, and it's a, it's a really great caterpillar for kids to watch because they're so readily come to our potted herbs if we, if we provide them so the kids can watch them grow up. So here again, this is the garden. This is the common milkweed I was talking about. Uh, and so we hear in the news and we hear um, from Monarch Watch, and we hear over and over about the importance of planting milkweed from, for monarchs. And sometimes the message that we need other plants gets missed. So this is another swamp milkweed that I just talked about. It's gone to seed. These are the seed heads. The caterpillar is still happily eating away, but there's nothing left on this plant for this caterpillar after it becomes a butterfly. So there's no nectar there anymore. This Joe Pye weed in the back, um, a native beautiful flowering, it's flowering now, <clears throat> gets quite tall, eight feet, but there's some that only get four feet tall depending on the species. That's an excellent flowering nectar producing um, plant for any butterflies that come along. So as you're thinking about pollinator gardening, uh, if you're thinking about monarchs, for instance, as important, as very important as milkweed is, so are all the plants that are gonna sustain that butterfly once it hatches and pupates and becomes an adult. So here we have monarchs on mist flower, which is a native um, flower that's just now coming into bloom. This is a cup plant. And I have these just to highlight how important these nectar sources are. This is swamp milkweed yet again. See, it's such a beautiful plant. These are met our um, great spangled fritillaries on it. They, their host plant was violets. That's the only plant that these various fritillary species of butterflies will lay their eggs near and then the, the young eat that. 
and then they go looking for nectar and here they found the swamp milkweed. So talking about, so that was, that was moths and butterflies very briefly. And I'll get at the end more to um, plants, other good nectar plants and pollen plants. For bees, here we are again at the sunflower. Um, sunflowers are made up of tiny, tiny hundreds, maybe thousands, I've never counted. You know, when you look at a sunflower head and you see all the sunflower seeds, each seed came from a flower that made up the head. So there's all of these pollen um, flowers in here for the bees. Once the pollen is aged, so the pollen comes from a male to a female flower, it doesn't live very long. And as soon as fertilization or pollinate, pollinization, pollination has taken place, the pollen dies off and the plant begins creating seeds. And at that point, it's not of much use to the bees anymore. This is a, a Mexican sunflower, an ornamental, and you can just barely see each of these little sticking up parts are separate flowers, like right there is a separate flower. And that's also full of pollen and full of nectar. And I don't know, we can't see very well, but right here, if you can see my arrow, there's little yellow dots right here. Those are the pollen sacs on the bees. And you might notice, you might have already noticed, when you see bees on sunflowers or other plants, their legs start to get yellow or red, and they're filling up pollen sacks with pollen to take back to the, to the nest. And so as hard as it is to see, these little yellow dots are her or his pollen sacks that are being filled up. This plant is called short tooth mountain mint. And it doesn't look like so much in this picture. These are the flowers, these tiny little white. But in the next slide, I'll show you when you put it in a, um, a mass, it looks, it's silvery, it kind of shines in the moonlight. It's, it's a, a, can be a formal garden kind of a plant. And if I could only pick one plant for pollinators, this would be it as I'll show you here. So watch and see all the different types, the different sizes of pollinators of bees, primarily bees and wasps. This was from a couple of days ago. So magical wouldn't be, in my opinion, too strong a word for going out your door and standing. It's safe to stand near them because they're so busy doing what they're doing, eating, trying to survive. They don't mind if we're standing up there watching and just, just watching all of that movement in your yard and knowing that you're, you're providing food where there wasn't food before uh, for all these bee species. This is a, a really a feast for pollinators here. This is a late summer, early fall. Uh, these are anise hyssop. <clears throat> and all of these, I think most of these are available in garden centers. And I'll tell you about another place to get plants here and just at the end. Um, this is anise hyssop. This is gray goldenrod, the yellow. The white is white wood aster. <clears throat> This purplish is mist flower again. This other purplish is aromatic aster. And the bees and butterflies just go from plant to plant to plant to plant for the whole summer, you know, what's left of the summer eating from here. This is again the, the uh, anise hyssop or agastache. And I'll show you why I have this in my garden as well. Besides, it's beautiful for me to watch.
So it's just amazing. We've only lived in this location. This is my second summer here. And I put these plants in last spring. So they were flowering last year. I have no idea where all these bees came from and the butterflies, but particularly the bees. You know, there's, there's no other flower source like our yard anywhere close by. So where they all came from and where they were eating before we moved here, I have no idea. Uh, it's almost like spontaneous generation, which I know it isn't, but they weren't here and, and suddenly they are here because the food is here. And the same in any garden that's planted with pollinators in mind, uh, they, they find it. Here again is another late summer. This is New England aster, the purple, and the orange coneflower again, which is really, it's called coneflower, but it's a black-eyed Susan relative. <clears throat> and the nice thing about it is it starts blooming right about now, later than the black-eyed Susans we're more familiar with, and it blooms it almost to November. So as long as there's bees around, um, there will be nectar for them. Both of these plants will bloom on way into the fall. So just some snapshots of gardens, of all the different kinds and ways you can think about gardening for pollinators. Some are large, like this one. This is the one that was covered with snow uh, in that other. And it didn't start blooming heavily until late July or August, which coincidentally seems to be the time most of the bees have emerged. Certainly there's bees before now, but the, in the season, uh, late summer is the time when we're just seeing bees everywhere we look. So we have here Joe Pie. This is one of the shorter ones I said. So that one is called, um, well, it's called Dwarf or Three Nerved Joe Pie. You can get that one at garden centers. This is more of the orange, orange cone flower. This is garden phlox. <clears throat> this is some more anise hyssop here. And the, the reason there's all these cone flowers is because I just let them seed and, and see where they go and what they do. I'm not, I'm more of an adventurous gardener, curious about what, what will happen next year rather than determining what will happen. But people make beautiful gardens that do that. This was a friend's garden from Manada. Um, this is tall Coreopsis, and it gets tall. It gets eight feet tall. It blows in the wind. The bees are all over it. The butterflies are particularly attractive to, um, floss is particularly attractive to butterflies. So if you can imagine strolling out your, your walk like this, just surrounded by movement of pollinators, it's just amazing. I see this, this isn't my yard, but, but I, when I go out the door each, each day now, I think again, this is so amazing. All I did was stick plants in the ground and then just let them go. This is a garden with lots of flocks, different colors of garden flocks that again, the butterflies and the hummingbird moths particularly will come to. Bees will as well, but it's a favorite of the hummingbird moths and the and here's some zinnias, which you can hardly see there. Those are great landing places for butterflies. So butterflies love zinnias. They just land on, the, it's like a helicopter pad. They land there and then they can use their long proboscis to, to go into each little tiny flower that makes them up. Here's a more formal garden. That's, again, there's the path there. There's another path over here. So this is a contained garden with phlox and purple cone flower. She had some daylilies. Um, more phlox in here. I think that red back there was a Japanese maple. That's why it's not flowering. <laughs> so that's just a beautiful garden that's, that's of a different nature. And with a pot, anything that, that you'd like in a pot could go in there. Here is an island garden that this was on a slope. So this garden is contained by the grass. And that can be a nice way to think about gardens. Um, and this is where I like to say, especially in a year like this, that has been so dry last year and this year, it's a good time to, to think about how much land, how much space do you wanna care for? How much time and energy do you have to care for it? Um, whenever we put a garden in, in the spring, 
we have to water it all season long. If it doesn't rain, we have to water it or it'll die, we'll lose it. So sometimes I'll just say flat out, sometimes it's better to start small and expand over time as you assess your own energy and, and time and all. Um, the older we get, the more important that becomes. But this garden is just a beautiful example of taking a, a, a confined space, keeping it confined by mowing around it. And this is a close up of part of it. So here we have bee balm, two kinds of bee balm, which again, the hummingbird moths love, the bees love, butterflies come too. Uh, this is a gray headed cone flower. All of these are also good for birds. This is garden, uh, not common milkweed. That milk, so by this was a few years old, the picture. So by now, the milkweed might be sticking up all through here, just so you know. Um, I think this was phlox in the background. This orange, it looks like daylily given what else is blooming now, but that, that orange um, butterfly weed I mentioned, which is another kind of milkweed, would stand out orange like that and be quite attractive. Right here is an aster that will start blooming purple in probably a few weeks, it looks like. So this garden has something for all kinds of pollinators in it, as well as birds that will come and pick the seeds out of the, the cone flowers here and over here. This was a rain garden that was some years back when I lived again near Elizabethtown. This was the end of the driveway. The water rushed down the driveway and off into the backyard over here. So one year I decided to dig it out and take it down about six inches below where it was, the, the level of the soil, and plant it. And after that, then so you plant plants that will do well when it's dry and do well when it's wet and don't mind standing in water for a while. And this became quite a lovely pollinator garden. This is the Mexican sunflower. <clears throat> you can see it gets quite tall. It's in, um, fills in for trees or shrubs if you're looking for height. And black-eyed Susans and phlox. This was swamp milkweed here. This was the year that the monarchs seemed to come in mass and all of this swamp milkweed was defoliated completely all the leaves were eaten. And I was looking for other people that had milkweed that I could either take the caterpillars to or I could bring them, cut their milkweed and bring it back. So you never know, some years you hardly get any um, monarchs and eggs and caterpillars. And some years you get more than you can feed and you never know which it's going to be. <clears throat> this was a really beautiful bed, again, just of cone flower. It was a partly shaded, uh, all our gardens don't have to have flowers of all kinds. Here's just a, a really nice example of a beautiful coneflower bed. And it was covered with butterflies. And then in the fall, the birds are picking all the seeds out of the seed heads. So you can also think in gardening in terms of different beds, different places around your yard, if that's something you want to do, rather than trying to clump everything together. <clears throat> And here you can see a little bit of how, you know, purple cone flowers are beautiful anyway. They're native to the Midwest of this country. And as the forests were cut down, they started moving East. And as people found them and loved them, they started planting them back East. And so they support so many different butterflies and bees and birds. This was another shaded garden. So if you have a shaded area, you can still plant. So a lot of this, these plants love sun. And again, this is where this book that I um, put up has conditions for each of the plants to help you know what will thrive where. This was black cohosh. Um, this is covered with tiny bees when it's blooming. And then this is again, garden phlox, which is also covered with butterflies and hummingbird moths and some bees. And so taking whatever area you have and planting it for the conditions that are there is really the easiest way to garden and the most effective way to garden. 
most of the plants I've talked about, except for the zinnias and the dill and um, fennel and those have been natives to this area, to the east. And most of the, the pictures have been mostly natives. Um, but this garden was a combination of native and non-native, natives from around here and then non-natives from across the world. So the Joe Pie is native. And this little sneezeweed here with the yellow flowers is, and the garden phlox is. Um, this is a big shrub here, Virginia sweet spire that's also native. And then they added the purple cone flower and this cup plant are native to the Midwest. The campanula and the daylilies and the sedum here are native to other parts of the world. And it made a beautiful garden. Um, lots of layers, it's attractive to the human eye, it's attractive to pollinators and birds, um, especially with the different layers. So we have the freedom to branch out and pollinators will make use of almost anything that's flowering, somebody will use it for sure. But what if you don't have room for all these perennials? and you want to have stuff, uh, flowers blooming all season long, because perennials will bloom for a few weeks, each of them, and then they stop. And then you hope another perennial takes over as, as the sequence goes on. If you don't have room for that, or suppose you've just moved to a new house or your kids have just moved to a new house and they, they're not gonna have money yet for perennials, annuals will work really well for pollinators. It, we. Most of us don't have the room to put in lots of post plants, lots of nectar and pollen plants. So we have to choose and just decide to do whatever it is we can do because whatever we do offers life to somebody that wasn't eating in your yard before. So these are little zinnias, profusion zinnias that just bush out and make a colorful all summer long. These are um, the blue salvias, purple salvias that are annuals, that they're covered with bees all season long. These two here are tropical milkweed um, that, cat the, that the monarchs will use, bees will use it. It blooms, all of these are tender. So once, once the freeze comes, they'll die off. And here again is one of my, those favorite um, orange cone flowers or those late black eyed Susans that I just like to stick in wherever I can. So annual gardens are perfectly acceptable for pollinators. And they also work really well to stick annuals into your perennial beds to fill in just for color because you like them or for color and nectar during times between when different perennials might be blooming. So it should probably go without saying, but I say it anyway, given all that we've talked about, Eliminating pesticides is so important, be it weed killers or be it insecticides. Uh, the goal is to allow these creatures to live on, to grow up. If we've become used to gardening and being upset when we see poles in plants or parts of leaves being eaten, which is how most of us were taught as we absorbed how to garden, we wanted the perfect garden or a lot of us did. And holes in the leaves didn't, didn't mean it was a perfect garden. But when you're gardening for pollinators, you welcome those holes because it tells you that somebody's eating here, somebody's living here, and that's the whole goal. So we, we allow these caterpillars to eat, and then we have the butterflies that everybody's excited to have. And we have them until frost, until heavy freezes. And the same with the bees usually. And all of these only live a few weeks, each of them for the most part, be it butterflies or uh, moths, we don't see as much unless we're out with a flashlight at night. Butterflies and bees that we see in the daytime, they only live a few weeks, each of them. Um, and so gardening for them gives them the best chance to reproduce and for the species to go on. Now I said about where you could get plants. Manada Conservancy has a new uh, greenhouse up in Grantville. 
I think somebody needs to mute their microphone there. So Manada Conservancy is having a plant sale this a week from yesterday, August 17th from five to eight. And then Saturday, September 11th from 10 to two. Their website is manada.org and the plant list is on the website. So you can see what they have. There's also, we created years back, we created, there's a section on their website that says native plants. And there's lists upon lists of plants and um, when they bloom, how tall they get, dry conditions, uh, wet conditions, sun and shade that can be used as a guide, as a starting place. So um, in ending the program here, this part, and then we'll have lots of time for questions if you want. This particular garden again, and at the, the slide is a favorite. The quote is a favorite of mine. This was from John Muir. Everybody needs beauty as well as bread. Places to play in and pray in. Where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. Gardening for pollinators invites nature and its healing right into our own backyards and we are all the richer for it. Thank you. I will stop sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, Anne. That was such a wonderful presentation um, with such valuable information. I really, <laughs> I've really learned so much from that. Um, wow. I love uh, bees in particular, and so it's always nice learning about bees and how we can you know, keep bees happy and healthy and, and abundant. Yeah. Um, at this point, I am going to allow folks to unmute themselves if you would like to unmute your microphone to ask Anne a question, um, but also if you would prefer typing your question in chat, um, please feel free to do so. Um, I will be monitoring the chat, answering questions as they come through. Um, again, you should be able to unmute your microphone now, so if you would like to do that as well, you're more than welcome to. Um, yeah, so open up the floor for questions. Thank you, Pamela. I will say that putting together a program like this, there's so much information that it's hard to, I, I never know whether enough meaningful information has been given. And so that's why, again, I'm gonna just keep plugging this book, which I don't make any royalties off of, had nothing to do with, but there's so much good information um, as a starting place. And if anybody is already gardening for pollinators and you have favorite plants that, that you just couldn't live without and you wanna share that now, that's a way for everybody to learn as well. Okay, so Jane and Judah say, how do you prevent unwanted insects like ticks and mosquitoes? So mosquitoes become more and more challenging now that some of the alien ones have moved in that don't even need standing water. Uh, so that's harder, but certainly if there is water around, you, you probably know already too. If you, if you have a bird bath or you're putting out a lid, say of water for pollinators, then it needs to be changed every few days. Uh, the water, both to keep it clean and to keep larvae from hatching or from growing anyway. Um, ticks can be challenging. And I'll say Sometimes, depending on what your yard is like, can you say more about, um, would you want to unmute and say more about what your yard is like? Like, if it's, is it next to woods or is it next to fields or are you creating within a neighborhood? Um, Jane and Judah say they're unable to unmute. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you won't let us. Hold on. You should be able to. I've just asked you to unmute. So hopefully. There they go. Okay. Now, Jane and Judah. I we should be able to hear you even if we can't see you. There we go. Can we hear you hear, hear yes. now? Yes. Cool beans. Um, so we are actually we just bought a house in suburbia. Um, so it's a bunch of grass everywhere. Um, and we're, we're, we're wanting to change that, at least in our yard. Yeah. Um, so we're just looking for, I guess, ticks is our bigger concern, though there's not a lot of woods. 
Okay. And we have we have kids that are going to be running around in it, so we're. Yeah. So, are you seeing ticks now in the grass as you're out walking in the yard? Are you bringing ticks back in with you? I don't think we have seen any. We've seen like we're in the we're in Middletown. We've seen it some in the area, not not in our neighborhood. Do you have deer going through your neighborhood? Have we seen any deer yet? I mean, we've re we've really only been here for two weeks, so. Oh. <laughs> Okay, well, what I would say is, first of all, if you don't have animals going through the neighborhood that are carrying ticks, then you're a lot less likely to have them in your garden as you start creating it. So that's, that's one positive thing. Um, if the ticks come in, the only way to, to not get them is not brushing up against the plants. So if you, if you create those island gardens, say, and you're mowing around them, then the plants, that you, you're putting in on purpose will, will flower there. And the kids don't have to be right up against them uh, unless you're with them and, and, and not walking through them unless you're creating like a two or three foot path, which you could certainly do. If your paths are two and three feet wide, say, if you wanted them to go through a garden and you're in the middle of the paths, ticks won't be a problem. It's more if you're brushing up against the plants themselves which sooner or later ticks will probably find you. Um, and I had kids and, and I've had Lyme um, and still it just feels so important to do this work of gardening for pollinators. So it may be that creating smaller gardens, it may be that gardens against the house where you've got if, if you have the situation where you have a sidewalk and a garden area and then a, a wall, a house, that's another way of um, reducing the ticks getting to the garden in the first place because the sidewalk is a, a barrier. Okay, thank you. I know it's, I wish there was something we could say that absolutely we could do this and we would have no ticks, but we're beyond that point uh, in our society, I'm afraid. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, we have another question from Kim. Kim asks, is lavender a pollinator? Lavender is a good plant for pollinators. It, it, it'll be covered with bees. While it's blooming, it'll be covered with bees. It's one of the best bee plants. Um, so if you have it, enjoy it. And if you don't have it, you can put some in and that would be a great plant. I forgot to say, this was so important and I forgot to say it. If you're wondering what plants support pollinators well, go to your garden centers and just walk around and start looking or go to the plant sales and just, you don't have to buy anything. You take a pencil, a pen and a notebook and just start writing down the names of plants that are covered with bees or with butterflies. And that's a really easy free way to see. And if you do that several times through a season, then you see what's blooming in the spring and the summer and the fall and which of those plants are covered with pollinators. So it's another way to learn. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Um, if anyone is having trouble unmuting their microphone, please um, say so in the chat if you would like to unmute and um, ask a question. Um, otherwise, again, feel free to use the chat. Um, we'll wait a couple couple more minutes. And if we don't have any other, other questions, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. <laughs> You know, if you have, um, maybe let's do it this way. If you have questions that you want to ask me separately, privately, Emily, if they emailed you, you could give them my email address. Sure. Absolutely. Rather than me just putting it in the chat, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to answer questions that come up. Like I'm going to be thinking about that tick question and wishing there was an easy answer. <laughs> um, but you know, now that I'm thinking about it, if you plant lower growing things as well, um, that's another possible way of, of diminishing, brushing up against a plant that's a plant that's one or two feet tall doesn't harbor the same danger as a three or four foot tall plant just because of the way we brush against them or don't. <clears throat> and then, and I did get another question. Um, what was the name of the plant that you said if there was one plant oh. to get? It would yeah. be that plant. 
Short, any of the mountain mints. That one was the short tooth mountain mint. I think because the leaves are the way they are. Um, those plants should be available at that Manada plant sale. Some garden centers are carrying, there's, there's three or four species of mountain mints. They're all, they're all white. The other ones look like lace running through the garden. Um, they're finer. The leaves are finer and the flowers are finer. But the Manada sale, if they don't have them now, they'll have them in the spring for sure when they have their plant sales in the spring. And, and I'll say too that fall is really the very best time to put your gardens in. So if you had to choose between fall and spring and you had a choice, especially these last two years, fall is the time to do it because the roots start growing. Um, the tops are, are becoming dormant. They're not putting out new growth, but the roots continue to grow until the ground freezes. So next spring, when next spring comes around, they're ready. They've matured in their roots and they're ready to take off growing. I'll say personally on that note, um, I moved here last May and I planted a lot of things in my personal garden and I wasn't um, super enthusiastic about some of the, the results, but this, this spring oh. and this year, oh my goodness, everything has absolutely come alive. Yeah. Uh, particularly like the wildflower section that I tried to plant, just lots of, of insects. So I, I guess I would say along those lines, be, be patient. Yeah. Um, allow uh, your your garden to really you know, go through its its cycles and its seasons. Um, and if it's not producing immediately right away, that's okay. It it yeah. takes a lot of time, <laughs> um, as I'm sure Anne will attest to. It's yeah. a process and it's a learning process as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. There's a saying amongst nurserymen that you may have heard or may not have heard: the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. <laughs> and they just, just explode. And so if they don't do it by the second year, they'll do it for sure by the third year. I like that saying. I don't think I've heard that before. <laughs> I like that a lot. Yeah. So, well, thank you, everybody. And um, I would say I'll keep an eye out for you. But since I can't see anybody's faces, I won't, I won't know who you are. <laughs> so um, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anne. I, uh, on behalf of myself as well as uh, the Dauphin County Library System. Thank you so much um, for thank again you. being here and, and sharing your expertise and mm -hmm. wisdom with us. Um, and good luck everyone with your gardens. I hope that, that everyone cultivates wonderful spaces. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. Um, I will put my email in the chat uh, mm -hmm. very quickly. Um, if anyone wants to uh, reach out to me um, to get Anne's information and I, I'd be happy to give give her or give you her email address. Um, so thank you again, everyone. Let me just hit enter before I end the, end the meeting so everyone can see that. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. All right. Bye, Emily. Bye, Anne. Thank you. Take care.